and uh, so I get a lot of tunes that have those meanings embedded within them. Uh, not all of them, because we sing about love, we sing about hurt, we sing about pain, we sing about the blues, but uh, as far as spirituality is concerned, I'm very conscious uh, of the message of the songs that I sing present to my audience, because uh, you know, it says a lot, a lot about who I am and the message that I want to, you know, project and give to the audience. You know, so I want people to always leave a little bit more positive and a little bit more knowledgeable after every show. So. Is that how you are first attracted to a song? Is the words and the spiritual? You no, know, it's no. just the song. If it just sounds good, if you know, if it feels good in my soul, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, two weeks ago, I was watching this movie. It's a film noir, and uh, in the middle of the film, this one steps up to the mic, and she goes, leave me alone, you mustn't touch. And I was like, I was captured from that moment, and I was like, I can't tell, and she's like, oh my god, I gotta sing this, I gotta sing this. And I'm fortunate enough to uh, have a maestro that can interpret those things, and he uh, goes along with me in my excitement when that happens, and so I can send him the clip, and uh, like I said, I'm very blessed that he has the year, and he will give me the time to equate that into a chart that we can work on, and, and we worked on my version of that song, so, and I found several of uh, the songs in my repertoire, quite a few, actually, from what I know, and just listening, seeing Hobie Carr, I thought I'd just got to play you know, tunes that, you know, a lot of tunes that you don't realize that that's a whole game line, tune, or that he even wrote a tune called Baltimore Orioles, that type of thing. Do you have a baseball team? Yeah, yeah. Do you have a baseball team? Yeah. 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 What's the story about a bird? Yeah. So now back at the church, did you ever did you sing? You said it wasn't fun. Well, we sang. It's call and response in the, in the Methodist Church. He sang the lead. Yeah, oh. We sang the response. Oh, okay. And very rarely did anybody else get to sing. Because, I mean, he was good. I mean, he was excellent. Nobody could beat him. <clears throat> and uh, it was a sense of pride for the church, you know, because every church would have a revival and invite all the different choirs. And, They'd have five nights of church, and every night there'd be like four or five choirs would come in, and you know everybody wanted to see who had the best choir, and who had the best lead yeah. singer, and who got, had the best song for that year, and that. so you know. And my 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 uh, guardians, my mom, my mother's sister who raised me, uh, she was a nurse, she was an Eastern star, and she was definitely a Christian woman. So you know that was a part of. You went to school, and you went to church, and you lived in her house. Those are two things that you must do. You know, if you had no way around it, there was nothing that you could do other than do those things. So, so how did you, so you moved out of the, the church when you went out to college? Or? Well, I got a job my senior year that took me away from the church on Sundays. That's the only way you didn't have to go to church. It's just you working. <laughs> so I washed dishes at this restaurant called the Bell Club on Sunday uh, afternoons, and I just got so I didn't have to go to church, and uh, <laughs> I didn't have to sing in the choir. But uh, that was around my senior year, and then the next year I was in college. And uh, the first year, I just kind of bummed around and had a good time and party. In my hometown, I've always been known as a dancer. I love to dance, I love music, as I said. And, and singing was through the choir uh, at church and uh, high school choir. Uh, also, choral music. Those types of things, we went to choral festivals and learned big pieces and learned French and things like that. But in college, uh, you know, I just kind of thought, well, you know, that part of life was over, you know. And uh, I was out my sophomore year dancing uh, early on, and these guys surrounded me and asked me if I ever thought about being a drum man. And I was like, uh, I can't read the music. Yeah, I was I know. I thought that was great. <laughs> I, I was dancing and I looked up and there was this, this circle of guys around me watching me dance with this girl and they said, you ever thought about being a drum major? And I was like, well, I can't read music. They were like, well, you don't have to. You got good rhythm, you have a good ear, you're tall, you can dance, you can dance, man, you can dance. 
So for the next three years, I, I marched as a uh, drum major, the final year as head drum major in a, a major historical black college, uh, which is, I come to find out 35 years later, a really big deal. But when I was dead, I was just a kid doing what kids do, you know, so having a good time. Sure. Sounds a little bit like a rumble. <laughs> it, well, some people said we looked like we were going to war every time we played a game, and that's really what it was. It was a battle every day. But the thing about that and my early experiences in school is uh, they were my first brushes with the process. The process of singing? The, just the process period. <coughs> Learning a tune, rehearsing a tune, practicing a tune, you know, performing a tune, staging a tune, all those kind of things. Uh, even with uh, um, the marching band, a performance, the same thing. Rehearse, 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 rehearse until you can yawn whatever it is that you're doing, where you don't have to think about it. That way you can just be in the moment. Right. And it's in your bones. Right, it's in your bones, it's in your DNA by the time you finish. And when you do it that way, then you are able to, at any given moment, make quick changes. So they can come and say, oh, well, we don't want you to go that far, we want you to cut right here. Well, if you know your material well enough, then you're able to make those transitions. And so it makes it easier for whoever is producing or arranging or whatever to, to work with the All right, so after your marching band, mm -hmm. what uh, propelled you or brought you from Mississippi or the school of the college was in Mississippi? Yes, it's so, Alcorn State University in Lorman, Mississippi. So you came to San Francisco, you didn't go to New no, York? I went to, to, I went to Long Beach to my uncle, who oh. was in Long Beach, California. My uncle had a band, and he claims that he's the drama on uh, the Persuasions, Cowboys to Girls. I don't know if that's true or not. But by the time I got here, he was pretty much a burnt out shell. <laughs> but I came out thinking that, you know, I was going to get with him, and he was going to help make me a star, you know. So I got here and found what I found. And then my sister came down to visit my older sister, and she convinced me to come back to San Jose. Little did I know I was jumping out of the fire to the fire. Oh, you know. Yeah. Out of the frying pan to the fire. But uh, I got to San Jose and we got no place to stay, so we stayed in one till six. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Until I got a job and started working. But, uh, you know, there was no music for quite a while. And no music in your life? No, 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 no performing music. No performing. You know, you know um, I just didn't know how I would do it. I didn't think that a soloist, you know, that's a lot of work. And it's, Look, you can't just go out and say I'm going to be a soloist and be successful. You know, it takes a lot of work, and you still got to buy food and pay the rent and you want clothes. And I, at that point, I was still in party mode. So every Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, I was in somebody's club going, "Hey, hey," you know. So you know. Uh, so how did that how did that transition happen from your party? I had a friend. I had moved oh, to San Francisco, okay. and I had a roommate friend who sat me down one day and said, you know, you are a real bitch. <laughs> you need to go and sing or do whatever it is that you say that it is that you do. You say you, you're a singer, you want to sing. And I was like, oh, and he's like, go find a choir, go find somebody, but go sing, please. Just, just you know, stop being so. And, you know, I listened to him and I joined uh, Dick Kramer's chorale and sang with a men's group for like about a year and a half. And after that, I joined the cast of a play called Tokens that had 65 members in the, in the cast. It was a play about the, the plague in London, and it was done at Theodore Artaud, uh, untraditionally on a blank stage where we would use the audience as part of the crowd scenes and things like that, move them around, build houses and stuff in the middle of the empty spaces, and break them down. So it was a real big theatrical event uh, produced by Ruby Goldberg at the beginning of her career. She put up, uh, as much money as you would put on uh, one act of a Broadway play, she put it to this play here. So, you know, and we paid her back. You know, we were able to pay her money back. And her boyfriend was the author of the play at the time and was keeping her daughter, who was in the play. So I did that, did something else with uh, Bread and Roses, and I realized that the acting was overtaking the singing. Yeah, what, and how did you feel about that? Well, I, I, at first, I'm a singer. Uh, I can act, I acted out through high school, but I'm a singer, I want to sing. So I decided not to do any more plays. Oh, so you just I stopped, stopped cold plays. turkey. Yep, 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 yep. And uh, around this time, I also uh, 
realized that I didn't have the control that I really wanted. You know, I could do things, but I couldn't really do them when I wanted to do them at call. So I realized that I needed some training. I needed some training and technique. You so, mean you, I'm sorry, you mean that the, there were things about your voice that you wanted to? Well, when I want to go from a roar to a whisper, or uh -huh. I want to, you know, in a, within two notes, mm -hmm. you know, there was a chance that I would make it, and there was a chance that I would you know? Awesome. So, you know, if I wanted to add certain things, I didn't know how, if I would add certain tones, certain colors, you know, certain parts of phrasing, I, I didn't have the knowledge at that point. And so I went to Blue Bear School of Music and studied with Ras Kennedy for about three and a half years, and one of the first two things he told me was that I had a voice that people would pay money to come and see, and that I could sing everything that a woman singer could sing in octave lower, which blew my mind because I always liked women singers because they got the best songs. The men were always begging. And the women got a chance to sing about life and love, but the men were always baby, baby, baby. And it's like, I know I'm not a beggar. I'm sorry, I'm not a beggar. So, <laughs> you know, I'm more attracted to the material of a, of a, of a lot of the classic female voice singers. And him telling me that, Spurred me on to listen to Sarah Vaughan, to listen to Ella Fitzgerald. Uh, Ella Fitzgerald, really, because she's like a textbook. She's the exact melody. Mm -hmm. I mean, the exact melody of whatever it is that she's singing. Now, she may elaborate in the second round, but that first go round, you get to see exactly what the songwriter wanted you to, to hear. And so if you're learning a piece of material, she's one of the first people that I go to and see if she has a recording of it because I know I can get the exact uh, melody. And early on in working with Dave, I would come in singing these alliterated versions of people's standards. And he was like, man, you know, that is not the original <laughs> melody. <laughs> you need to learn how to sing the melody first before you start doing that type of stuff. You know, learn the melody first. <laughs> and then you can do all that other stuff, you know. But you know, he was a valuable, an invaluable tool to me uh, in so many things. And that going to Blue Bear was also because I learned not only technique, uh, but I learned how to take care of my voice as well. So I learned how to sing properly and to sing around holes and things like that, which came in handy my first uh, trip across uh, the water to Berlin where I had to do a special performance and I ended up with a sinus infection. And I had to sing. I had to sing. More than enough, I only had to sing like three songs, but with proper technique, you can get through that. You know, you, you can make it through. So. Okay, so now how did you get to Berlin? <laughs> well, <laughs> I had been working with Dave, yeah. and uh, we put together a six song CD called Retro Nouveau. I called it Retro Nouveau because the music that I do is sort of like making old music new. And it also gave people an idea of how to pronounce my name, Den Baco. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he had a, a former client of his who lived in Berlin. I had friends who lived in Berlin who would ask me if I would come to visit. And uh, so I said, sure. And so Dave hooked me up with Eva in Berlin. On a Saturday night, I, I went to visit her, meet her for the first time. And on Sunday night, I was standing in a club in Nietzsche uh, in Berlin singing uh, the New York City. Mm -hmm. And in an audience, uh, the guy says, uh, well, we don't have no microphone. And I said, uh, well, I don't need a microphone. <laughs> and he says, all right, all right, all right. And so I started to sing. And it's, it was back in the time when it was smoky, and people still smoked in clubs and stuff like that. And it was real noisy. People were really, 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 really. And I started to sing, and everybody stopped talking. And they turned around and looked at the stage. That, that was the first thing I was like, okay, settle down now, you know? And in that version, that arrangement, there's a, a key change towards the end. We call it the Star Search key change. <laughs> and I sang uh, that key change, and the audience applauded. And that scared me. I was like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> because I wasn't expected. But I had gone to Berlin because I really, I had done some things here. People have always been complimentary. It's just, you know, this is a dream for me. I'm living the dream, and it's kind of hard at the very beginning to believe that your dream is really happening, come true. And your friends always want you to be good. They're always going to support you. Even when you're bad, they're still going to say, well, you know, that wasn't so good. But you did. You got up there. You did. You did a great job, you know. So I wanted to go someplace where nobody knew me. 
where if I made a sour note, they were going to tell me. If it didn't sound right, they were going to say so. Oh, no, you can't come back here and say no. <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, and I wanted people who were not biased, who did, like I said, who didn't know me, who had nothing invested in, 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 you know, making me feel good and you know, telling me the things that I wanted to hear. And I had this opportunity to go to Berlin, and uh, well, everybody knows cabaret, the movie, and the whole cabaret scene, you know, the kind of stuff. So you kind of think in your head, oh, I can go to Berlin and be like, you know, the stories that Christopher Bishop would have wrote, you know, and go to the bars and sing and stuff. And it really happened. I spent three months there, and I went from bar to bar, and open mic to open mic. Uh, my uh, host convinced me to buy a, a prepaid cell phone, which they call what they think is American slang. They call it a handy. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a handy the third day, the second day that I was there. <laughs> And so I had my own phone number, and when I would go out to open mics, I could meet people, give them my phone number. We didn't have to have any problems with communication. And I just started to go to different open mics all around Berlin. And I began to, uh, to gain a reputation. Uh, and it really uh, validated what it was that I wanted to, to do when I went there, was to say that there was some value to what I was doing, and uh, it was okay to, to proceed forward, okay, to seek this because I had never up until that point really believed and allowed myself to think that I could I could seek that that goal. So for then gave you the confidence to do that. The beginning of the beginning of the confidence. Yeah, yeah. 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 And and you understood your voice better maybe? Or at least the audience reactions. I understood the audience reaction better and uh, I got a chance to use some of the technique and stuff that I had learned in school. To be consistent, and like I said, that, that one concert that I had to do was a performance class for a bunch of German students who were doing all uh, uh, American jazz tunes, and to hear big German accents uh, singing, you know, a hand in the hand is quite continental, but diamonds are you know, you know. So for them to hear an American singing English. Know, singing American music in English is, is charming to them. And they really support music, so I never had to worry about getting anybody into a club. All I had to do was just show up and sing. So now what happened, uh, then you came back. So what did you find the cabaret scene like here in San Francisco when you came back with all this knowledge? I had done some things. Uh, the very first thing I did really, really here in the city was a cabaret conference that was put on by Shandy Rainbow. Uh, and through that I met Linda Cossett and Laura Dar and Barry Lloyd and so many other people. Uh, it was a, I'm sorry, a conference? Uh, it was a weekend uh, like event that had master classes and uh, we went to performances and then it culminated with a final performance for us at, uh, at the Plush Room. So my very first San Francisco debut performance was at the Plush Room, you know, which was pretty cool. I was like, wow, you know, this is the big time. I'm hitting the big time right at the top, you know, right at the beginning. Little did I know it was going to take a lot of work. Okay. But uh, no, it was very exciting. Uh, it was a weekend. That's where I met Weston Whitfield. I met Faith Winthrop. Uh, just a lot of really good people in the industry here, and uh, they embraced me. And so I would go to the Kitchenette's open mics. Uh, they had one called Fake Tuesday uh, at the Big House, and they had another one at uh, the Purple Onion. And slightly before this, when I first started to go out to sing, uh, I would go to the Sony Metreon. Uh, the Sony Metreon downtown, where, where they have, uh, uh, they used to have a, a Sony store there, and Julian's Restaurant is a sports bar. And in the back, they had a little small, like little, lounge? little lounge, oh, okay. a little martini bar. Oh, and Richard name. Elliott was the host, and his mom would send out the invitations every month. Oh, to Target. And yeah. uh, if you did, if you did really well there, you went there and you sang there. And if you did really well, then you got to do a showcase. Oh. Yeah, well, about twenty minutes, huh, Richard? Well, from twenty minutes to an hour with yeah. Gary Newman. Right, right, with Gary Newman on the piano. So. And uh, I got progressing. Yeah, I got a chance to do a showcase. I did my showcase there. He didn't have to dress as Sally Bowles, and we didn't applaud him. <laughs> <laughs> and he still showed up. <laughs> but the thing about that performance, Richard, I'll tell you, uh, 
after that performance, uh, a guy came up to me and he said, man, that was so good, I feel like I should have been paying you. And I thought that was the greatest compliment anybody could have ever given. You know, you know I, I was like, wow, you know, I'm really doing what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, so I started to do the open mics with the kitchenettes, and you know, I really have to say, uh, express my appreciation to both Lua and Linda uh, and Barry because they always kept me in mind. Uh, they always nominated me for things, and uh, they always included me. So as I did more things. I got more exposure and I got to do more things. I was a, one of the new stars of the Purple Onion. I got to be a new star of the Raz Room. So, you know, uh, traveling to pretty heavy heights and working on material. I've recorded a couple of different CDs. What Love Is is a CD all about the different types of love. And uh, my romance is just a, a bunch of romantic songs. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, really kind of felt my own. and found out and was realizing what it would be like, I found a muse in the music of Harold Harlan. And so uh, I was encouraged to put together a show of the tunes of Harold Harlan because he wrote so many tunes that people have no idea are his tunes. They think, you know, that's a Sarah Vaughan tune or that's an Ella Fitzgerald tune, but they don't realize that it's a Harold Harlan tune. And almost any night you go out to any club, somebody's going to see a Harold Harlan tune. If they're singing there, if there's open mics, one Harold Arlen tune is going to come up, if not more than one. Somebody's going to sing something about Harold Arlen. I don't care where you go, it's going to come up. And I was finding these tunes, I thought, to make myself different, I would sing songs that women sang, that men didn't traditionally sing. So I picked The, the Man That Got Away. And then I found uh, My Shining Hour, and I found, I already knew about uh, Summertime, not summertime, uh, stormy weather, and uh, get happy. And so after one or two tunes, I'm like, well, how many tunes does this guy have? So I started to do research. And you know, the thing about doing open mics is that you get a chance to practice the material and see how it goes over with the audience. So I was able to uh, flesh out a whole bunch of our Harlem tunes and then put them together into a show, and at the same time, we were able to record uh, a CD of that material. That's in the vault, it's never been released. Uh, and uh, we did the show at the Purple Onion. Uh, we premiered it at, uh, at uh, Martoni's, so we did two nights of it. Uh, and it was a success, and that was the thing that kind of, I felt, okay, you know, I'm kind of in the pocket here. I'm still, you know, moving towards, but, you know, I'm farther along than, Towards getting to where I want to go. Um, did you did you want to sing your Ireland music? Are you ready for it? Well, we're going to do it, but one more. Okay. Okay, she's going to take a second. We're going to go ahead and do Ireland. Do we need to? You can stay here. You can stay here. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an idea of what that show would have been like. Right? Afraid of it. 
and an idea of what the evening was like. So I'll show those two and three. Thank you. Walmart over the rainbow. I even put that on the CD, I just. I'm not Jimmy Garner, although I challenge her. Is that part of your spiritual side? Well, you know, you've got the stars of lots to All right, so now we'll go to we don't want to pause over that point where I know you met somebody that's made a big difference in your well, life. Well, so I did that show, yeah. and um, as I said, through knowing people in the community, uh, you get wind of different <coughs> activities that are happening. And I was contacted and told that Marilyn May was coming to town. And Linda Cossack gave me an early warning and told me that I should really take the class because this lady was really dynamite. And I was like, Marilyn May, I didn't have my so She was on the Carson show, she's great, don't worry about it, just, and she's doing a master class, okay? So, uh, I trust Linda. And uh, I signed up for the master class and got a chance to see her before her show and have her do body mechanics at work on me. You know? And, uh, wow. Even to this day, I just when I think about it, I get chills, and I just think, wow, you know. It was almost like being transported back to a time when entertainment was really highly valued in this country, and performers were really genuine in their talents and in their art, and they were unique, each individual, but they were strong in what they did. And when I saw her at 84 years old, she's 90 now, <clears throat> when I saw her at 84, I couldn't believe that this 84-year-old woman was doing what she was doing with no assistance. She was doing hitch kicks, <laughs> you know, and uh, grapevines across the stage, uh, you know, and so I took her master class and she was like, hmm, I don't really need to tell you very much, you know, you're an entertainer. She's like, but you pop your peas. <laughs> Watch that pop your peas. <laughs> but the wonderful thing about it is part of that master class is uh, we got a free performance of her show. We got to see a, a free performance. So I got to see her whole entire act. And to see someone 84 sing for an hour, hour and a half, continuously, she says, no, none of these on stage, no stools. Nobody came to see you sit down. They came to, to be entertained. <laughs> and so she, she does not sit. Her whole entire evening on stage, she is on her feet. She may lean on the piano right now and then. She does not allow water bottles on her stage. No, 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 that's fine. She says you should have, you know, a nice piece of cut glass or something like that, you know. But water bottles, and uh, one night that she was there, the, the, they, the crew in the band played a trick on her, and they put all these little mini water bottles on stage. And she came out to do a number, she turned around, she sees water bottles. So you know what she does, I think. She picks them up and starts throwing them into the audience. And says, I told you no water bottles on stage, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I got a chance to talk to someone, one of the greats from the early period of, of uh, and not so much early, you know, later on, uh, period of great jazz music in this country, uh, someone whose career was kind of cut short by the Beatles and all the rock and roll coming in in the 60s. So she went back to uh, Kansas City and she sang for 11 years, three shows a night, seven nights a week. And when they went looking for her to open the Metropolitan Room in, in New York, she was ready and she hit the ground running and she hasn't stopped yet. She's 90 years old and if you ever get an opportunity or a chance to see her, I mean to really go see her perform, if you can't afford it, I'll buy your ticket. No. Because it's worth, it's, it's worth it. It's worth it to see that consummate of a performance, that, I mean, that, that, uh, it's a master class in itself just to go to her show, just to see her do what she does and do it gracefully at 90 years old. I, I only hope to live long enough to be able to do what she does. You know, and she says, oh, I like it when you come. I'd like to show you off. And, you know, so of course that makes me very happy. <laughs> you know, but uh, no, she's a great person. And she told me some things in those conversations that we had after shows to like go out and find a place and tell them to let you have a night. And she's like, honey, tell them. Make your little stage and tell them that they're going to have to wait. It's going to take time, but you go there and you have a night 
where people can find you every month, and you do that. And people will eventually start coming, and you'll build an audience, but you will also build your repertoire, you'll learn things about being on stage, you'll learn how to handle hecklers, you'll just gain the experience of being a host, you know. And so I took her advice, and uh, I found Savannah Jacks in the mission. Uh, and I was there for three and a half years uh, in sort of like a residency where I did, uh, initially I had one night a week, I mean a month, where I did three one hour sets in the evening from 7 to 11. So that's 30 songs a night and each set to be different from the first one. You know, from the one that can't receive it. So every time I did a show there in three and a half years, I did 30 different songs that night. And then he was gracious enough to ask me if I would post his open mic on a Sunday. So uh, when I left there, I was doing two evenings of three-hour sets. And I mean, it really does uh, give you a great deal of knowledge and information about being on stage. And it goes a long way towards making you feel comfortable or look more comfortable on stage uh, because you're better equipped, I think, or prepared to deal with things as they come up. You know, you're not so afraid because you've had everything in the world that happened to you from people throwing up in the audience to people falling out to people yelling and screaming to, you know, no audience the whole nine yards. But in three and a half years, uh, it was a great, remarkable experience. And uh, they've sold the club. And so I was without a home. And through the gracious uh, blessing of Lil Dar. She sent me an email and said, you know, these guys are opening this store called Society Cabaret. You should probably <laughs> check them out, you know. Maybe you could do something there. And uh, that was my first introduction to Christopher and to you and to Scott and to, to uh, Tim and the whole crew. And I mean, you know, you guys really started off with a bag. I'm sorry, but you spoiled us. <laughs> and you know, I, every time I would do a show out, I was like, you know, I really want to be there behind because they never should have done what they did that first show, you know. <laughs> Which was, I had a hotel room. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was like I was like I was like I could hear Abby Lincoln say, "Stick, stick with me, son. This is what it's gonna be like." Okay, you know, <laughs> a nice lavish room for you to get dressed in to relax before the show. You come downstairs, but you know, uh, economics doesn't allow for that to happen these days like it did in the old days. So I do understand, but I mean, I really have to tell you, I've been through a lot, I've done a lot of things, I felt very good about stuff that I've done. That night, I really felt like a star. And I had performed that, I, I had performed that, you know, I yeah, I performed in a lot of great places in the city, but that night, you know, I, like, yeah, I was full of myself. <laughs> Water. Water. It's in a tech glass. Marilyn yes, yes, yes. she, she, she would be proud. She would be proud. So, uh, now Marilyn, you had two things from her. So you saw her perform, and you got a lot from that, but she also talked to you. So, what, what was the most, was it a combination of those things, or was it just, one Well, just the, the fact that it was Marilyn May telling me that stuff. I mean, she's 84 years old. She started when she was like nine. She was on the Carson show like 76 times. Uh, I mean, she sells out everywhere she goes. Um, I've heard it from a lot of people, the same things. But this is Marilyn May. I mean, like, I'm, you know, I was gaga at that point, okay? You know, I had taken the master class, then I go to her show. Then afterwards, she comes out after everybody leaves, and she signs everything, and everybody leaves. And she says, you know, stay, stay, honey, come sit with me and have a cocktail, you know? <laughs> And it's like 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night, you know, and here I am sitting with Marilyn May, and she's telling me about, oh, I couldn't stand Sarah Bud. And I was like, Sarah, get on with it. Just sing the damn song. <laughs> you know, so she's telling me all these stories about people and how Johnny Mercer told her that her version of Misty uh, was the best one that he had ever heard recorded. And uh, just all sorts of things about the industry. I mean, it's invaluable and it's very much so. It was overwhelming for me for someone who was as influential and as popular and as I mean, as good as she was to sit down and take the time uh, with me to talk with me and to have an exchange. And she said to me, you know, I 
do this because it's important. And what I'm doing is going to survive if it's going to go on. People like you have to be encouraged. They have to be shown that what they're doing is important to keeping this music alive. And so she takes time after every show and sits outside and talks to people and encourages people. And if you take her master class, I mean, she's very encouraging. She's very real. So don't go up in there thinking that you're going to saw it, you know, half step <laughs> because uh, she is real and mad, you know, and she's going to tell you the truth. But it really, it really did embolden me. It really did strengthen my thoughts about my abilities and what I could do. Um, Around about this time, I was still doing things at Martini's. I did an open mic there called Song of the Month that was passed on to me by the Kitchenette. So see, as I say, things continuously in the community, we pass things around and uh, allow each other the opportunity to gain the experience of uh, whatever the object is that we're doing. So I was still doing uh, an open mic, and I know to get one of the open mics. Uh, I finished singing a song, and Bob Johnson, who's our music, she music to a row, was there, right here. And as when I stopped, uh, Bob called me over and he says, you just made a breakthrough. He says, I just witnessed you really come into your own. You know, and so it's, it's an amazing thing to have something that you do um, acknowledged and validated by people that you respect. You know, and people that you know, know what they're talking about, you know. Because I never set out on this, to, you know, it wasn't a plan. This kind of just so of all kind of felt like it was. You found your passion as you went yeah. on, yeah. journey of life. Huh? Oh yeah, definitely. I, said, I definitely say I'm on his path because I did not plan this. I did not think as a little child that this is what I was going to be doing. I just had no idea. I had no idea, and but I knew I loved to sing, and I knew people enjoyed what I did. And but I was a realist. Um, my one of my very best teachers in high school uh, offered to help me get a music scholarship to uh, USM to study voice. I said, man, even if I go in there and do that, what am I going to do with that? I can't make a living off of that. You know, I I need a job, but I can make some money being an orphan being on my own, being an only child, my concern more than anything was <coughs> to take the burden of my responsibility off the people who had borne it for all this time because they had done everything that they could do. It was my turn now. It's my turn to go out and work and take care of myself. And so I just didn't believe that that was going to bring me what I needed. You know? And I even went to college based on uh, uh, former Miss Alcorn, who was a high school counselor, sent my transcript to Alcorn without my knowledge. <laughs> and I got a big old thick packet from Alcorn stating that I had been accepted, I had a dorm room, I had a meal ticket, I had a BEOG, I had SEOG, and all I had to do was buy my books. And I was packing my clothes to come to California. And my mother says, well, you can go to California anytime, but you need to get an education before you go. I was like, well, I was like, <laughs> And on top of that, the fact that Alcorn is 14 miles in the middle of the woods, okay, and I'm, I'm gravitating towards the city and they're trying to put me where they don't even have night games because there's so many skunks in the woods. <laughs> okay, so, but you know, I listened to her because she was right, you know. Uh, she had another friend of mine, a real good friend of mine who had graduated from there, and I had a cousin who had graduated from there. They all talked to me. And said, you know, you can go to California and demand a better job if you have a college degree. And through that experience, I gained the band and all the things that I gained from that. Well, she, she's probably gone now. But oh, uh -huh. No, no, the uh, lady that did all that. Oh, Miss O'Neill? Miss O'Neill, yeah. She did it without my knowledge, and I found out about it at the funeral services. Oh, oh. <clears throat> I was home and I happened to be there and they were burying her and I went to the services and I was telling people how uh, just how much she was good to us when we were in school and I was telling people about my experience at all and they said you know Miss O'Neill did that she did that for a lot of kids yeah she did it for you and I was like wow you know uh, I just didn't know what to say because she did it without any uh, Quest for any type of acknowledgement or you know, any 
glory or anything like that. She saw kids who uh, deserved a, a chance, and be, being a former Miss Alcorn, she had she had an in there, so she could she could phone up and say, hey, you know, this kid right here needs you know, some financial aid, and, and she did that for me, you know. So you know. She did it and passed it forward. Yes. Well, you know, somebody did good for me, so I firmly believe that every singer, every person who wants to sing a song, deserves to be supported in some way, shape, form, or fashion. You may not be the best singer in the world. I have a friend, uh, Vietnamese friend, Tui Lin, who has a bit of a speech impediment. Yes, she's from San Jose. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I encourage her. She worked through her difficulties to find her own style. So, you know, but I truly believe that what has been done for me, I can never repay, but through helping someone else to get to their chance for their goals. So, you know, any singer, people are like, oh, you met the I don't care. They can't do what I can do. So, yes, they're welcome to my stage. You know, I would love to showcase people, you know because it gives them an opportunity and it encourages them and it validates what they're doing and it, you know, means that there's more of this going to continue to go. So yeah, you know, uh, I think it's a wonderful thing and uh, in part because people have encouraged me, Marilyn May, Wesley Whitfield, Faith Winthrop, Frank Jackson, uh, so many others, all people who are vital in the industry or work and doing good things, but they still stopped time to encourage, to motivate, to support. So and I follow their lead. Well, you certainly had some challenges in your life, but you certainly met them head on too. But uh, what, is, uh, what is the medical diagnosis that you had that's meant to your art? What does that meant to your art? Uh, you know, I don't, I haven't really come to that conclusion yet, you know, because I'm still in the, mid, I'm still in the middle of the yeah. battle. Uh, in June, I was diagnosed with what they thought was liver cancer, but uh, it turned out that it's not. Uh, and I've been in treatment since then. Um, I'm like about 60% through treatment and moving off of intravenous drugs into oral medications. So I'm slowly coming off of the medications and the progression has been stopped. And now we're shrinking all the tumors. So it's given me a lot of time you know, to research material, to think about things I want to do. <laughs> You know, watch movies and listen to music, and I come up with a couple of tunes that I'm working on. Rocks in my bed yeah. was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and another one, the blues is a blue one. And, uh, you know, but what it's meant really is, you know, I think when we get to moving too fast and we get to Everything is a blur because we got to do everything, we got to do it now, and I got to do this, and I got to do that. Uh, we miss things that are right there in front of us. And sometimes it takes being set down in a situation like this and given the time to go through your life and look back and see what's missing and what really needs to be worked on. Because now you got the time. Okay? Now you have the time. So, uh, if anything, it's given me an opportunity and a time to work on a future. <coughs> uh, I'm planning a solo voice and piano CD. David and I have standards and some other tunes that we found. Uh, I'm also, Dave and I are working on a, 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 one, a, a one afternoon master class where I'm going to try and share some of my experiences about production and performance. Um, you know, and just, you know, keep it going, man. You know, life is good. Uh, no matter how bad it gets, there's always a kernel of good there. If you can, you know, just mm -hmm. Look hard ignore all the negative stuff around it and, and, and think to yourself that it is there. It's hard sometimes. It's hard. But uh, I think that we're resilient, and as performers, definitely, uh, one of the first things that you have to learn is to accept rejection. Because not everybody's going to like what you do, and, uh, but you can't take it to heart. And so uh, all the things that happen to you, you have to take with a positive attitude and think, I'm going to do what I can do until I can do it no more. 
And when I can't do that no more, then I'm going to move it down to what I can do, and then, then I'm going to do that till I can't do that no more. <laughs> and just keep doing what I can do until I can't do it no more. <laughs> I sing everywhere. This guy told me, he says, you know, I pulled up on you at the bus stop. You were just there just sing a yard out. Hey, you know. Well, you know, I, my car is my rehearsal studio. I have rehearsal tracks of everything. So when I'm riding around, I'm singing and rehearsing, you know. Uh, my favorite song to build out. I think probably whatever it is that I'm working on at the moment. There is no one song because every time I find something, I say, like, oh, that's my song, that's my song, and something, I find something else, oh, that's my song, that's my song, that's my song, oh, that's such a good song, you know, so, you know, it, it, anything that feels good to the voice. You know. Okay, now here's another one. What, uh, if someone hasn't heard you sing before, uh, what would you, how would you explain your sound in just uh, five words? How would you explain it? Uh, the style or the sound is most related to uh, Retro Nouveau, which is old, they made new, sung with a definitely uh, a throwback voice, a male voice, uh, bass voice singer, so more of a romantic take on uh, the American songbook. Uh, given modern updates to the arrangements by a smooth <laughs> jazz vocalist. <laughs> deep velvet. Deep velvet. Deep velvet. Deep velvet. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, I'll take that. I'll be deep velvet. All right now, do you have five artists or songs that I would hear you looking at at the moment? Just name two, I think. Uh, yeah, do I have five artists? No. Or, or songs? What about some songs you're looking at? Are you looking at some songs that are in the future? Those two, uh, Blossom Deary has a song called You Fascinate Me So. Uh -huh. uh, I've been working on that. And uh, uh, Abby Lincoln recorded a tune called A Woman Loves a Man. We've been working on that. More Emily Contents. So good volume too. Well, you know, I, I so that was uh, uh, intended. I figured if they, if I put volume one, then that would encourage volume two. <laughs> not thinking that you know, not even having a volume two in mind, but I just thought, like, okay, volume one, okay, so that means dig for more material. And I have found, you know, I even had enough material when I did the first one to do two at the time. But I wanted to flesh it out and learn more material, and I have I, some things that I didn't do on the first album that I wanted to do. So it's just a matter of fleshing out those arrangements and finding the money <laughs> to record them. Mm -hmm. But the fortunate thing about working in Savannah is I had the same band for the whole three hundred <coughs> years, so they played those tunes, and we just go in and, and lay them down. And them too, so. You got them in your pocket. Definitely. <laughs> okay, now here's another question. And in the ball. Now, what's your favorite part of the process of creating for you? Learning. Learning something new and then getting it, especially when there's a different, difficult passage or difficult phrase or interval that you have to sing that takes you down um, the melody in a way that your mind, your body, your being doesn't think it should be going to be able to master that and then train your body to go where it's not wanting to go. I think that's remarkable. I mean, you can do it. Uh, it's just the most amazing thing because what happens is it creates this miraculous, beautiful tension in the music and it embellishes the music and it brings out the beauty of the music. So when you really learn the melody and you learn those difficult passages, when, I, when I'm in a point, and I had one in one of the songs I'm singing today, that I had to just sit and go with that, just these three or four words over and over and over and over to get the interval changed, to get the phrasing right so that I could do this right. 
And once I got it and could sing it to the back and track and do it, I was just like, ah, oh, you know. It's a Gaga moment for me. <laughs> I want to be retired and living in Palm Springs and singing for money. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank all right, so now Ben, you're going to leave us with another song yes, for this evening. Did you want to introduce the song? Well, I, I was going to do it. Uh, I kind of thank you guys actually for listening to my story. And, uh, yeah. Nice yeah. You know, in all of this, as I said before, you know, it's, it's all been so like a dream for me. I never really thought, you know, me. You know, it's, it's just, it's amazing. And so I thank you all, not only for this evening, but for everything, for being here, for encouraging me, and for uh, just enjoying what I, it is that I bring to the table, you know, and letting me know that so that I can continue to bring more. You know, that means more to me than you could ever know. And um, it encourages me in so many, on so many levels, uh, you know, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. You are my family. So these next two tunes, uh, this is what I'm really working on. So Paul, if you say, what do I belt out? This is what I'm belting out these okay. days. Okay. <laughs> right. Mr. Austin, can we do this? This is from a film noir I told you earlier. This is with my maestro on the piano. Leave me alone. Should touch. Leave me alone. I know too much. While you stay around, I'll just play around with love. Your love. Leave me alone. I can't be true. You should have known. Your heart's desire, haven't you learned? Children who play with fire always get burned. Find someone new, make them your own. But whatever you do, leave me alone. Some men should come with disclaimers, you know. Because not every man is a good man. Send this out before them. I know I'm your heart's desire. Haven't you learned? Children who play with fire always get burned. Find someone new, make them your own. But whatever you do, leave me alone. Say whatever you do.
Thank you, and God bless. Thank you so much, everybody. Like here, I felt like I was in San Francisco. They even have a street 
called Karl Marx Rasa. And if you squint your eyes, you think you're on a mission street. <laughs> the only difference is that it's all Turkish people instead of being Latin. But it's the same street on the other side of the world. <laughs> The exact same look. So when time we get homesick, I go down and walk on the straw, you know, and shop and stuff like that. But, uh, no, English is the money language. So people want dollars. Somebody can speak English someplace. So you always have that. Even in my worst time, at like 2 o'clock in the morning, when I was trying to find a club on snowy streets, and I stopped the cab and he couldn't speak English. He found somebody to speak English so he could take away and he you know, so he could get some power. So uh, it's not really a problem. And it's very easy to pick up, you know. Uh, it's, it's hair fried, meaning is this chair free or is this hair free, you know. Uh, just different things, different things. And I tried to learn it while I was there, but they are so I'm told to learn English from someone who speaks English. Yeah. They don't. They want to learn how to speak English, you know, or speak it well, because they don't think they speak it well at all. And I'm saying, well, I'm not learning it. Well, you know, just, just speak English. Uh -huh. But you can pick it up, and I think if you go there, you'll find you'll understand a lot more than you expect you would understand, because a lot of it is is dramatic. Our language is dramatic based. A lot of it. And what they do is they just put everything together. So when I say Karl Marx Strasse, that's all one word, but it means Karl Marx Street. So they smash everything together. And, you know, it's a crazy place, but it's a wonderful place to go. If you ever get a chance to go, go. You'll enjoy it. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah.